Good evening, everybody. We're going to see how long I can do this until my arm gets tired because when I organize, unlike most people, I lose things instead of finding things. So today I'm going to talk about the one thing that I actually have enough experience in to no longer be considered a junior, and that is being a QA analyst. It is also the thing that I have no interest in getting a job in as again, and we're going to talk about why. So, uh, backstory, I, it's a long story how I got into those QA positions, but basically what I've done is my first QA position was as a contractor at Quantum Health through Manifest Solutions. I was a mobile QA, and I say that tentatively because the manager couldn't figure out or she couldn't decide what she wanted me to do. My role would literally change like every couple of weeks. And unfortunately Manifest Solutions being the nepotistic um, piece of shit company it was basically just completely let her have her way because she was friends with the CTO. Once I finally got out of that hellhole, my next QA role was at Improving. Improving is actually the one consulting company I would probably go back to, but that team and client was not cool. And then the third one was a completely 1099. It was one of those weird where they treat you like an employee, but you're 1099. Um, but I was paid extremely well, you know, as were the other ones were about like, literally like what a livable income would be considered for that one. I was paid 65 an hour. Now, granted, I had to cover my own benefits and all that, but that's still a lot of money. Um, even having to take all that into account. Funny thing about being a QA and probably why I was put into it is because it's generally understood, right, wrong, or indifferent, that you can just throw anyone into a junior QA analyst role in a way that they don't often do with junior developers. And then, so that gets into the first reason, which is that you have to deal with the constant stereotype that QA analysts are very non-technical and cannot handle any technical details. Uh, now for the purposes of this video, I realize that there are QA automation engineers. For the purposes of this video, I'm gonna be talking mostly about being a QA analyst. There are some aspects or points in this video that could apply to a QA automation engineer, but most of the time QA automation engineers are recognized as developers. So a lot of it doesn't apply. So I'm talking about analysts. Um, so yeah, you're perceived as not being able to handle any technical detail. And it's tempting to just say, well, just grow a thicker skin and, you know, show them who's boss. Uh, yeah, I grew up with a narcissistic dad. Like my skin's as thick as the wall of China or as a GOP member skull. Like, you don't need to tell me that. But in addition to potentially being very offensive, it is also incredibly inefficient to have everyone around you treat you like you can't handle anything below any other language other than the English language. And sometimes not even a good grasp on that. Conversations take a lot longer when you have to constantly prove and show that you can handle technical details, um, to ask technical questions, to even get the space to be allowed to ask technical questions and then to get them answered, and then to have to keep asking questions because they keep giving you answers that don't go into the details because, again, they think you can't handle them. It's just, it's very death by a thousand paper cuts. It's one of those things that sounds really petty, but if you've ever been in that situation, then you know what I'm talking about. And so that segues nicely into our related but completely separate second point I want to make which is that the developers hate you. Now, this is commonly understood to the point that it's actually quite a meme in the uh, QA community, but essentially your job is to try your best to work with a group that has a vested interest in not working with you, if that makes sense. Now, there's a lot of uh, debate of varying degrees of maturity as to how much of the onus is on the QA to be emotionally intelligent and how much is on the um, developers to be 
uh, receptive to criticism. Uh, but the reality of it is that I have found in most of the organizations I've worked for is that due to kind of, again, this bias in our society to assume that because somebody is technical, they are smarter, and we just tend to kind of give them this little more of a holy status, generally speaking. You know, when push comes to shove, like, the developer's always going to win. The business is usually going to side with the developers. Um, in the rare cases they do side with you, uh, the developers will often throw an absolute fit, and they will get their way one way or another. Um, not to mention, too, a lot of companies are more likely to hire QA as contractors um, than devs. Don't quote me on that, but that's generally been my experiences. And when you are a contract, you just have way less leverage. Like, again, contract against a salaried employee. And the worst part about it is that this doesn't even necessarily have to be the case. I have actually been on some teams and have worked with some cool devs that view me as not somebody there to make their life suck and point out that their poor baby is ugly, um, but as someone to save their fucking ass from embarrassment and uh, chastising from the management. But unfortunately, developers are not known for their humility and their ability to take criticism. And again, in our society, if someone's very technical, they can get away with a lot of shit. Um, so it's a new day, new hairstyle of me trying to put off washing my hair as long as possible. So the next reason we're going to get into, I don't know what number it is in this list, I'll figure it out later in editing, is that QA, and I alluded to it in an earlier part, is that QA are much more likely to be hired as contractors. And if you know anything about contracting in the United States, it is... Basically, as one former Agile manager I worked with put it, it's basically meat processing. The process is so detached from any actual output, and it becomes more about, okay, I got as many people into a position as I did, so I get paid well. For my viewers that are not in the United States, there's also way less protections for contractors than there are for uh, full-time employed or FDE, as you often hear. It was not unusual at all for me to just literally have my uh, permissions for my accounts needed to work turned off overnight and early come in the morning and they'd be like, you don't have a job. That sounds barbaric, but that is just the reality of being a contractor in America. Even when they are not contractors, overall, I've just seen QA just dealt with much more flippantly. In one of my last technical writer roles, I worked with a QA who was basically set up to fail as much as possible so that they could justify firing him. And what wound up happening is that another department basically just took him. But they were just ready to completely fire him. His manager literally just ghosted him and faced no repercussions. Which sort of gets into my next reason. Really, I debated with whether to even make this its own reason, considering it's kind of the backdrop for all the other reasons. But I think there's a particular pattern that goes on that needs to be pointed out which is that QA are set up to fail. They really are set up to fail. The core problem with the current way that we do software quality is it's one of those jobs where if you were doing your job right, people forget you exist. And if stuff is not going well, you may get blamed even if you've done everything you can. Coupled with the earlier aspects I talked about that makes the general view of QA generally worse than other positions and you get basically a recipe for a resume um, that looks like this and so and I, I don't think people understand how messy it makes job searching in the future when you keep getting jobs where you're set up to fail and I know 
that's not the thing you're supposed to do is to be like, well, I need to improve and, you know, I, I need to figure out how I could improve and not blame everyone else around me. Yeah, there's a lot of value in that, but at some point you need to call bullshit. And I've reached the point where I'm like, yeah, you're right. The thing I need to improve myself on is stop applying for QA positions. But we're going to get into the final reason that really made me say, you know what? I'm done. I'm fucking done. I can't do this anymore. I'm not even applying those for those positions anymore. Because here's the thing. The other reasons could be dealt with if you're paid enough. The short tenure, the being treated like shit, like, you know, I'm like, fuck's sake. I come from a background where women were constantly treated like they couldn't do shit. And you know, like, and then went into a male dominated field. Like I could, I could fucking take some shit. I I've been thrown around like it's child's play at this point. Um, and when you're making really good money, like I said, my last QA position was really good money. Like you make really good money. Fine. You can only keep me for three months. Like I'll have enough money to hold over till I get the next position. But here was the thing that made me said, no, I'm, I'm done. Like I'm, it's, you, I'm not doing another QA position unless it's really something special. Um, and that was the fact was that I kept getting shoved back into that little fucking box of just go and pass those JIRA cards. Get that JIRA card passed. Get that JIRA card passed. How many JIRA cards have you passed today? Pass those JIRA cards. Pass those JIRA cards. That was the thing that made me said, I'm done. I am done. I'm done. You can't pay me enough. Because during the times that I was a QA, I would actually get very depressed because a big core tenant of my personality is constant learning and constant development and I wasn't be able to do that on the job despite the fact they would often tell me in, their, in, in the interview process that I would have chances for learning and growth then I had a few QA managers that tried to do that but their own hands were bound sometimes and I after work wouldn't really have the bandwidth to consider learning I did my best but it felt like the vast majority of my life was basically just churning Jira cards. And I would get very depressed, like really depressed. Like that 65 an hour doesn't really matter anymore, depressed. And so that's why I'm not a QA anymore. Have you been a former QA? Do you wanna share your experiences? Are you still QA and you like being a QA? Like am I just completely fucking off base? Is it different maybe if you're not in the United States? Or in the Midwest? I don't know. Let's keep the conversation going. Just in time to finish this. As the heating turns on.